Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being so prompt, coming back uh, on time from lunch, which we hope you enjoyed. Uh, we are now going to have some very interesting keynote addresses. And I'm going to start by uh, introducing Dr. Kanta Ahmed, Associate Professor of Medicine, State University of New York of the United States of America. Dr. Ahmed is a physician, nonfiction author, and broadcast media commentator. Her first book in the land of Invisible Women, Source Books, 2008. Say again. Technical issues? OK, no problem. We won't let any cyber fake news get the best of us. After these three lectures about cyber, we know when someone's trying to, trying to create some sort of a terrorism fake news situation. So thanks for pointing that out. OK. So, Land Invisible Women, Source Books, 2008, details her experience of living and working in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and has been published internationally in 14 countries, translated in multiple languages, now printing its 13th edition. Dr. Ahmed is noted international speaker in both her fields of medicine and journalism. She volunteers her limited time for Women's Voices Now, a nonprofit foundation as a member of the Board of Directors. In June 2015, she was inducted as an honorary fellow at the Israel Technion Science and Technology Institute in recognition of her efforts combating anti-Semitism and radical Islam. And the Technion is really comparable to our MIT. So if you received an honorary fellowship there, it's a good investment. All the best and please. Um, uh, uh, good morning, Boker Tov, Toda uh, Rabah for inviting me, Shana Tova in advance. Um, let's start. Oh. oh, can we start? Can we start the first movie, please? I'm here to talk to you about Kurdistan. You just saw Heli Love, who is a global sensation, a Kurdish woman in the Kurdish diaspora from Finland who is a rap star, who was filming a movie on the front lines while ISIS was uh, um, threatening and advancing into Iraqi territory. I've just come back from Kurdistan. I'm here to share some observations. And I was there in a capacity as a physician and a humanitarian, but also as a voice against radical Islam. And I think it's an important region for everyone in this uh, room to know about. You've all followed uh, the battle, uh, the war, and now the aftermath of uh, ISIS. And Kurdistan truly is a Zion in waiting and a landlocked uh, Zion, a, a country that is uh, uh, suffering in post-colonial sequestration. <laughs> So what you see, uh, you know, of course, are the world-famous Peshmerga fighters. Many of you in this room would have advised them in the capacity of the international coalition that assisted the Kurdish Peshmerga in, in battling with ISIS. Um, and uh, the Peshmerga are a unique fighting force, uh, national heroes in Kurdistan, and by the way, have more women in combat in the Kurdish Peshmerga than even the Israeli military. Though having met with the Kurdish Peshmerga, they have huge admiration for the IDF in particular and deep affection for Israel. When you visit Kurdistan, you see scenes like this. This is an average view of the Kurdish landscape. You see a Yazidi temple in the, in the, uh, in the background. And this is very much uh, uh, the community that was brutally targeted by ISIS for genocide. The Yazidis are amongst the most ancient monotheists in the world, dating back centuries. Um, and their temples take this typical form in the Kurdish landscape. Um, Kurdistan also this is a view from the epicenter of, of the Yazidism, Lalish. You can see the flare from a, national, from a natural gas 
uh, um, outlet. That's the flare that you're seeing in bright sunshine in daylight in the spring this year. It is both blessed and cursed with enormous hydrocarbon resources. At least 40 billion barrels of oil, of which 10 billion have been located, at least 100 billion cubic meters of natural gas, makes this an extremely contested region and is probably the motivation for why Kurdish boundaries, which were designated in 1919, have never been realized into an independent Kurdish state. Now, many of the regions we've been talking about in this meeting have become critically important. I visited Kurdistan 30 kilometers north of Mosul, which was laid siege to by ISIS in a most brutal humanitarian assault. Over 180,000 Christians fled Mosul with their lives intact. Others, for the city of two million, had a, a worse fate. Kurdistan now is hosting two million uh, displaced persons, either refugees from Syria or internally displaced persons from inside Iraq, or displaced uh, um, Kurdistani people that were pushed back from areas repelled by ISIS. Equally, uh, Kurdistan is split and landlocked between these four nations, Turkey, Iran, Syria, and Iraq. And Turkey, Iran, and Syria are what Professor Baez Ganor uh, identified as the evil axis. So this is, I'm bringing you life inside the nexus of the evil axis, and the only thing that unites Iran, Turkey, and Syria is their animosity and hatred of the Kurds, and their intention not to allow them to become ever independent. I visited Duhuk. This is a view of Duhuk. It is a city of 900,000, highly advanced, constructing uh, lots of active construction, and a city of 900,000 is hosting half a million refugees itself. That's the burden on this community, and they're doing so with dignity, and the refugees are multi-faith. They are Yazidi, they are Christian, they're Turkmen, they're Assyrian, they're Muslim, and they live together without conflict in some of the most difficult circumstances. The arrival of displaced persons from Syria, the crashing of the oil prices in, in 2013, 2014, and the assault of ISIS all befell Kurdistan at once, bringing a perfect storm of problems for them. I was brought inside Kurdistan, and I want everyone in this room to write this name down or take a picture of this slide. This is Jan Kazilhan, who brought me into Kurdistan, a Kurdish Yazidi German national, who um, himself was a, a victim of persecution in Turkey. His parents therefore left Turkey, went to Germany where they received uh, immigration and his parents were not highly educated. A little boy aged five is going to German schools, not doing well without the language. So his family asked the neighbor, can you look after our son when he is five years old and so he can learn some German. So the neighbor was Mrs. And Miss, Mr. and Mrs. Schultz. They were Holocaust survivors. They educated him in Germany. Uh, they helped him with his homework, and at the age of 10, Professor Kazilhan went to the public library to learn about the meaning of the word genocide. He is now the world's leading authority on the psychological trauma of migration, and he personally intervened when he began to hear reports of the genocide of the Yazidi people. These are the people that were driven onto the mountain in Mount Sinjar by ISIS, where they died in the August heat, dehydrated, where babies died of heat stroke and heat exhaustion and starvation. Um, he saw these images and within days had written an opinion piece in a German newspaper. He motivated the German government to secure 95 million euros of funding for the safeguarding of whatever Yazidi people could be safeguarded. And he brought to Germany 1,100 Yazidi women and girls who'd been sexually enslaved or tortured by ISIS. Three years later or four years later, in, uh, in um, uh, Baden-Württemberg, I think is the province, all of those girls and women are alive, whereas many left behind have committed suicide. He knew this was not sufficient uh, to just uh, bring them, so he is now uh, building an army of psychologists, which is where I went to teach, inside Iraq. These psychologists are managing the child soldiers that have come back from ISIS, the girls that have come back from sexual enslavement, the women that have come back from sexual enslavement and trying to rebuild devastated lives. And many of these psychologists with whom I was hugely impressed, they're 28 years old, they're kind of the age that people here at the IDC are studying, are themselves victims of genocide at the hands of Saddam, genocide survivors of the Anfal, genocide survivors of the Halabja. So we have this remarkably moving interaction 
of genocide survivors trying to lift each other in one of the world's most disadvantaged nations, in a nation that is the largest stateless nation of people. They have a population of 36 million, slightly less than Canada, slightly more than Australia, that does not get to have uh, their own country. I was sitting in an audience like this, listening to this lady you see on the screen, and as a physician, I'm a seasoned physician, I saw that her face was mask-like, and she described in harrowing detail her enslavement to eight different individual men at the hands of ISIS. She's a mother of two. A man sitting next to me, rather like all of you, elegantly dressed in a blue blazer, began having tears down his face while she was speaking, and I turned to him to ask if he was okay. He turned out to be her brother. He paid a $7,000 ransom for her release. And when, she, when the time came, she discovered her sister-in-law was in captivity. She had to make the terrible choice of, do I seek my freedom or, and leave my sister-in-law? Instead, the, the ISIS commander said, well, we'll need another 7,000 for your sister-in-law. So her sister-in-law was freed, and this woman was further incarcerated. She was uh, so-called married to men from Iraq, from Libya, uh, from, excuse, excuse me, Iraq, Lebanon, um, Syria, and Saudi Arabia. One of the so-called ISIS husbands was a plastic surgeon. So this is not an ideology that is unique only to thugs. Um, and uh, now her, her mission, she sat in front of 200 of us, was to let us know what this ideology did so that the genocide on the Yazidi people may not be forgotten. One of the teachings of Yazidism, there are only 800,000 Yazidis left in the world, is that they may have, must have endogamous marriage. They cannot perpetuate the faith if they marry a non-Yazidi. And so now the leaders of the Yazidi community are facing the very real possibility of extinction through genocide because of ISIS, by the way, the 74th genocide in the history of the Yazidi people. And the Kurdish people themselves have had over 700 years of persecution. I visited camps where I found orphan children that were well-dressed, clean, with haircuts, living in very humble conditions, hopeful for a future, going to school in multiple sessions. Uh, there are too many children to put in one school every day. They have to have three or four sessions. And people here in Israel told me in the beginning in Israel this was also the case. And a huge fan base for Ronaldo and Messi. Um, and uh, you see here Dr. Kazilhan meeting and mixing with the boys whose lives he is rebuilding. In this uh, moment, I will just tell you that as a physician, I encountered reports of the sleep disturbances of children uh, in, uh, after returning from ISIS. Some of them have been held, not necessarily the children in this picture, for at least three years as child soldiers. They come back speaking Arabic, forgetting their own language. They go to their mother, cover your arms, cover your hair, this is not Islamic. They pray compulsively the way that they've been indoctrinated to, to do. None of this is Islamic belief. As a Muslim, I can tell you this is not Islamic belief, the compulsion. Some of the children are unable to sleep if they do not have a weapon-shaped object next to them. Some of the children are enacting decapitation in their sleep in the form of a parasomnia. Some of the women are running out of the camp in the middle of the night, terror-struck, thinking that ISIS is coming, and have even sustained ankle fractures doing this. So there's a great need for us as sleep specialists to research in this area. So this, this population is, is suffering deeply and, and must not be uh, forgotten. Most people will not know much about Kurdistan, though Israel has a population of between two to 300,000 Kurdish people in her borders. Over 30% of political positions in the Kurdish regional government are held by women. I was there the day before the national election in Iraq, uh, which uh, um, uh, was the first election after the Battle of ISIS. And everywhere you go, you see a picture of a Kurdish woman, the vast majority a Sunni Muslim, unveiled on a billboard asking for your votes. We go around the world as Americans looking for societies to liberate, to advance, to elevate. I'm thinking of my own uh, Pakistan, which in one way is extremely advanced and in another way is extremely uh, behind Afghanistan. Uh, and yet right under our noses is this extraordinarily rich, multi-faith uh, co country with advanced concepts of egalitarianism between men and women that has been utterly uh, neglected. Some of the students at the University of Duhok, they were not my students, they were English literature students. Here you see one studying Anna Karenina in English translation alongside George Orwell and Henry James. Show me another location in the Middle East where this kind of scholarship is going on freely and openly other than the state of Israel. You would be hard pressed and I've been to most of the region. 
Uh, Kurdistan spends more percentage of its GDP on education than many advanced countries, including the United States or Japan. 24,000 students study here, entirely paid for by the state. Of course, much of this is now pressured because of the fall in oil revenues and the siege between Baghdad and Kurdistan economically, which is how Baghdad puts pressure on Kurdistan. After the meeting, I was very, very much wanting to meet the Peshmerga, and I didn't think I'd be granted permission. But a few hours later, I met at the base in the, in the city of Duhuk, the per Peshmerga soldiers. These are women. I am not very tall. I'm five feet four. These women are not as tall as me. They have just returned from battle against ISIS. I asked them, what message do you have for me when I speak to other audiences? We need our independence. We deserve our independence. I met with their, their leaders. Many of these women themselves are commanders. One of the commanders spoke to me and talked to me about how when ISIS came into her country, she told her husband, honey, you watch the three kids, I'm off to the front line. I asked her, how could you leave your children knowing ISIS was less than 30 kilometers from Duhuk in Mosul? She said, unless I safeguard my nation, I cannot safeguard my children. That was her simple answer. And then she burst into a smile and said, by the way, I personally killed two ISIS commanders. And with great pride, uh, uh, understand this force is mostly Sunni Muslim. These are the Muslims that are at the front line of the terrorism that all of us are here sitting trying to, trying to battle. Though this force is also containing Christian Peshmerga, Jewish Peshmerga, Yazidi Peshmerga. The colonels that I met with have a personal security detail that is multi-faith. That is the level of depth and trust in this force. So when we think about how the Kurds must feel, I ask my, my friends that are Kurdish, here you see a Kurdish colonel looking out at the landscape in the countryside in Sumail, outside of Duhuk, and they feel desolate. There was a, uh, there was a referendum, and I'm closing with this uh, in a few uh, seconds. There was a referendum on September 25th. Uh, the president, Barzani, wanted the people to have a chance to say, do we want independence? 93% of Kurdish people voted. Uh, incredible turnout, it's unified. And what was the response? Global silence. The only international leader of any stature to say the, the Kurds have political um, uh, um, uh, rights and a mature political system that warrants an independent state is the prime minister here, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, which was a deeply felt uh, truth that the Kurdish people heard. Canada was silent, United States was silent, Britain was silent, Europe was silent, all the nations use the Kurdish Peshmerga to fight and do fight the battles on the ground, though the Kurds do admit they've got great support from the United States, were silent. And this to me is morally unacceptable. We are now looking at a region which is increasingly hostile, Iran, Turkey, which cannot decide if it wants to use the Kurds to kill ISIS or then murder the Kurds themselves. Um, uh, uh, Syria, as you know, is, is uh, get developing dangerous vacuums what wouldn't we give for a powerful alliance of a 90% Sunni Muslim country that feels strongly identified with Israel, strongly identified with Jeffersonian democracy, and yet we neglect it? One of the generals said to me, we know the Jews very well, we know Israel very well, the Jewish memory is our memory. They were a nation and a people without a state for centuries. We are a nation and we are a people without a state, so the resonance is deep. I'm going to leave you with scenes of hopefulness that I hope all of us here in any capacity, whatever abilities you have, you can serve to so that we live to see this moment again mature for real. This is Kurdistan the night before the referendum.
Okay. I want to thank uh, Kanta for bringing us up to date from the field on what's going on. Sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words, and uh, there's a lot to learn. There are human beings out there, and uh, that's part of counterterrorism. It's now my pleasure to introduce Professor Luigi Mocchia, Department of Political Science, Roma Tre University, Italy. He's a full professor since 1986 of comparative law, holder of the Jean Monnet Chair since 1999 in European Law and Institutions, founder and president of the Center Altiero Spinelli, Jean Monnet Center of Excellence, Centro di Excellencia, Altiero Spinelli, established in 2003 at the University of Roma Tre. He has held various academic positions, amongst others, Dean of the Faculty of Political Science, 1998 to 2008, Director of Postgraduate Courses. He has been visiting professor, delivered lectures at universities abroad, and has spoken at international conferences. Luigi, the floor is yours. for the button to press because I prepare a PowerPoint presentation. Yes, <laughs> it keeps moving. So thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, sincere congratulations to organize of this outstanding, which the, the, the button, please? One of them? OK. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, for this uh, outstanding uh, uh, initiative conference uh, uh, that gives me uh, the opportunity and more than that, the pleasure and privilege to address such a distinguished and I would say still crowded audience immediately after lunch is really something, believe me. And uh, to Jeff. Yeah. The, the, the first slide uh, uh, tells that I'm here in a representative capacity as project coordinator of a European project, Horizon 2020, named uh, ter Terrorism Prevention by Radicalization Counter Narratives, an acronym Trivalent. Trivalent is a three year project, it officially started in uh, May 2017, and it will end up in uh, April. Uh, 2020. So we are half, about half away. And this puts me in an uneasy condition in front of a choice uh, between uh, talking to you about, uh, uh, how to say, unfinished work, uh, uh, yet uh, without meaningful achievements to be presented, or providing you with uh, a detailed list of work packages, project work packages, uh, work packages uh, uh, but at risk, obviously, of boring you and going out of time. So I prefer to prepare this presentation, uh, uh, trying to give you at least an idea of prevalent uh, rationale in terms of its main goals and vision, while highlighting uh, some points of more interest, I think, in the context of this conference. So let's start by saying something about us. As you can see from this slide, a uh, 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 trivalent uh, partnership, uh, we call it consortium, is uh, quite a large family, or 21 members, uh, covering a wide range of countries and featuring a, a, a rather mixed composition. There are professional, there are academic, and there are expert partners. The majority of uh, trivalent partners are law enforcement agencies, LIAS. You see uh, 11 from 10 EU countries plus one from a EU candidate country. In addition, we have the academic partners. Uh, six academic partners, five from uh, four EU countries, plus ICD 
IDC, ICT, and uh, not by chance, uh, uh, this is the main reason, not the only reason, why I'm here today. And further on, we have uh, four more, four more, um, uh, four more partners from altogether from three EU countries. But let's come immediately to uh, what matters uh, more, apart from the quantity, the quality. So, what's the core business of Trivalent? It's shown here in a very synthetic way, because Trivalent focus is obviously on prevention, as the title runs. And so I try to synthesize these, uh, uh, this focus in this kind of trilogy, which express the main tasks and goals of our research project. So reading it through, the first goal is on testing feasibility of IT early detection tools, which means scrutinizing uh, uh, especially online sources, social media, in order to get the possibility and to judge on the feasibility and reliability of this possibility to figure out possible signals of early warning. Second goal is about, is on developing communication strategies focus on narrative formats, narrative formats targeted for specific contexts and audiences. Because in this field, I would say, one size fits all does not work. So we need to differentiate approach, especially with regard to social media, in order to address specific contexts and specific pub publics. So this is one of our main efforts. Last but not least, the third main goal is on designing, I would say, models and practices of community-oriented policing based on uh, partnership trust building and problem solving to be implemented through new skills guidelines and training the trainers programs, fitting the needs in particular of uh, 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 LIA's personnel, but more generally frontline operators, as well as civil society and community actors. So in the whole and in a most synthetic way, Trivalent rationale focuses on an ideal prevention based on balancing securitarian with communitarian approach. And that brings about the question how to understand for a community-oriented approach to prevention. Obviously, there is no time to enter here into details, so it suffices generally speaking, to recall four basic points which can help us in clarifying a bit this concept. First, prevention state strategies can be grouped, and the three one just mentioned, can be grouped together under the heading of countering violent extremism. The reasoning underlying this concept, countering violent estimate, CVE, is a turning point, makes, makes this, this strategy a turning point in prevention approach. In what sense? Because from the viewpoint of the responses to the issues posed by violent estimates, what matters is really not the nature of the response, but the way in which these issues should, are to be looked at. And as regard to prevention, violent extremism is to be considered rather than only or mainly a security issue, also a social issue. And at this point, I think that is worth mention some examples of indications in support 
of such communitarian approach. Out of many of such samples, I chosen four indications, four type, types of indication, four examples of indications, uh, taken them out of four reports. First one is a report, you see the, the title, based on a study commissioned by the European Union to British Council, along with partners as at George State University and the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, concerning the role of civil society organization in countering violent extremism. The report key findings can be synthesized in the following one. A holistic and bottom-up approach aimed to increase civil society engagement, building resilience in affected communities, groups, so as to strengthen social cohesion through social supporting programming in various fields, including education, healthcare, including itself mental care, and job training. Finally, religion should not be should not be seen as part of the problem, but of its solution. Moving to another example, I took it from this report issued by Triangle Center on Terrorism and Homeland Security at Duke University, where the crucial role of communities is emphasized by the proposal to change this terminology, moving from CVE to a more explicit expression term with the acronym, with the acronym complete public safety, meaning community partnership with law enforcement to enhance public safety. Further, coming to European Union, we have a more recent report issued by RAN, European Radicalization Awareness Network. The title is there, stating very, very clearly, as you can read, communities play a central role in the prevention of extremism and radicalization, and their engagement and empowerment needs to be reinforced and supported as a matter of priority. This is I would call it a European Union mainstream as regards prevention concerning radicalization. And this is reaffirmed in another report coming out of European Union institution because his report issued by the high level commission expert group on radicalization this organism is attached directly to European Commission, is a report, the, this final version uh, is from May 2018, last May, where it is highlighted the need for local multi-agency approaches involving all relevant actors, including local authorities, civil society organization, social and youth workers, law enforcement community police, officer, mental health care practitioners, and others. So that said, and to come to a conclusion from the point of view of Trivalen and my personal point of view, as I told right at the beginning, uh, 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 trivial uh, uh, activities are still in progress, uh, uh, so we didn't reach yet a, 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 a conclusive position as to how to strike the balance and where, how and where to strike the balance between securitarian and communitarian approach in terms of designing uh, models and practice of cooperation between law enforcement and civil society engagement and empowerment. However, with regard to the, also to the challenge 
challenging title of this conference, I would like to make a prospective conclusion by recalling that the very concept of CVE, countering violent extremism, as a new policy approach understood to mean preventative measures which seek to address drivers or root causes of radicalization posits the very question whether in today's world the art of counter-terrorism needs to be supported and completed with a lot more of people committed and skilled to work in the craft of prevention community-oriented based on trust building and problem solving at grassroots level. Okay. It's better, but it's a bit disturbing, you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. Yes. It's animated. That is important. It's not a dead thing. It's, it's something living. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, with this question in mind, and just reminding that uh, uh, violent extremism, of course, is a phenomenon which affects many countries all around the world. Uh, 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 on behalf of Trivalent, I'm really happy to say that we are very, very glad to have on board IDC, ICT, and obviously we'll be glad to get suggestion and to benefit from the outputs of this conference, as well as to join efforts, we hope, together with you, while inviting all those interested to participate in our initiatives and uh, uh, through uh, a mailing list that I hope we can uh, share, uh, we will uh, be pleased to invite you to our initiative and in particular those who would like to share views and contribute to Trivalent with their expertise are, of course, welcome. Thank you and every best wishes to you. That's it. Grazie. Luigi, thanks for sharing with us uh, your theories concerning extremism, radicalization, and what I also call terrorism. Um, and, uh, and now, actually, um, I would like to ask each of the speakers, to the best of your ability, to speak within the time framework that you're supposed to speak. Otherwise, we're going to get not on time here. We're not going to be on schedule. One of the most important things when fighting terrorism is, is to be punctual on time. So please <laughs> do the best you can. I want to knock these guys off at 3 a.m. 3 a.m. is 3 a.m. Okay, now, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce... Mr. Brian Dodwell, Director of the Combating Terrorism Center, CTC, United States Military Academy, West Point of the United States of America. Brian Dodwell is the Director of Combating Terrorism Center at West Point and an Assistant Professor in the Department of Social Sciences, U.S. Military Academy, West Point. He has served as the C in the CTC since 2010, spent four years as Deputy Director prior to assuming his current position um, in 2018, Mr. Dodwell has conducted research on various topics to include Islamic State affiliates, foreign fighters, jihadi terrorism in the United States, and U.S. homeland security challenges. He works directly with operational units on key issue areas. Mr. Dodwell teaches courses on terrorism, counterterrorism, and homeland security, and regularly lectures to intelligence and law enforcement community audiences. Prior to joining the Combating Terrorism Center, Mr. Dodwell was the Operations Branch Chief at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security National Exercise Division, which assesses interagency counterterrorism strategy and policy at senior levels across the United States government. And last but not least, he previously served as counterproliferation analyst supporting the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Mr. Dodwell holds an MA in Security Studies from the Georgetown Security Studies Program and a BA in Political Science from Wake Forest. Uh, we're very happy, by the way, uh, that uh, we have a professor, Asaf Mogadem, 
who uh, teaches on a regular basis at West Point and is now on sabbatical teaching at West Point. We're also very proud of your uh, West Point graduates who have come to IDC Herzliya to participate in our master's degree in counterterrorism. We welcome them. And last year, we were very pleased to have your president here, an outstanding woman who, uh, who made a great impression about West Point, which I'm sure you're going to continue doing in your talk. The floor is now yours. Okay, thank you very much uh, to ICT and all the fantastic people who make this great event possible year after year. We were initially mad that you stole a saw from us, but we're very grateful you loaned them back for a short period of time. Um, and again, thank you so, so much for being such great hosts. Um, the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point have sent representatives to this event for the past four or five years or so, I believe. Uh, usually it's been our former director, uh, Brian Price. In fact, this is such a value trip that the only way that I could pry him out and get myself over here was to force him to retire from the Army. Uh, and it worked. He's out. I'm in. Two months later, I'm here in Herzliya. So who's the big winner now? All right. Um, I'm going to do something a little uh, unconventional. I'll ask everybody to tune out for the next 20 seconds or so. Check your phones, Instagram, whatever, because I need to have a private conversation with any U.S. government attorneys who happen to be in the room or watching on YouTube later. So here we go. This presentation is my own view and not that of the U.S. Military Academy, the Department of the Army, or any agency of the U.S. government. Okay, we're back. All right. Um, so what I want to talk about today uh, with such a remarkable group of terrorism specialists uh, is the use of primary source material in our field, specifically the use of captured documents. For those of you who know the CTC, you know that this is how we cut our teeth as an organization. Fifteen years ago, we began producing research using captured enemy material based on our relationships inside the U.S. Department of Defense. Credit for this goes to that era, era of CTCers, some of those people who are merely emerging names at the time, but who have grown to become really some of the heavyweights in our field. Uh, Brian Fishman, Will McCants, Jared Brockman, Joe Felter, and of course, Asaf, who is near and dear to, to both of our hearts here. Um, and that went on for some time, uh, but then it actually slowed down a bit. The CDC continued to produce research, of course, but less was based on captured enemy material. This was for two reasons. One, with both major theaters, Iraq and Afghanistan, in the midst of a drawdown, there simply wasn't as much material being gathered. And two, more problematic, uh, for the stuff that was there, we found more resistance to using it for this type of broader strategic uh, academic work. Yes, we got a few bin Laden documents back in 2012, but 17 out of thousands isn't exactly a watershed moment, and it took another five years for the rest of uh, UBL's at-home library to come out into the public domain. Um, well, as the ISIS challenge grew and, and as some especially innovative thinkers in the U.S. government were coming to the fore, uh, we found the tides shifting. Um, and over the past year or two, we've really made some significant progress uh, in terms of providing access to and support for the, the public release of captured material. And this progress paid off with a couple shorter CTC pieces uh, earlier this year that we used to test our processes to do this type of work. One was a short article in our Sentinel publication um, that we released a couple months ago on rosters taken from an Islamic State female guest house in Syria. Uh, another was a report written by my colleague, Dr. Daniel Milton, uh, that we actually released last week. Uh, and he used Islamic State documents captured in Afghanistan to identify how the Islamic State, or IS, managed its media organization and exercised control over the media activities of its disparate wilayat, or provinces. But the project I want to mostly talk about here today is a long-term and deep assessment uh, that we are currently doing of the Islamic, State Khoras Islamic State's Khorasan province, or ISK. Um, this actually nests very well uh, with the panel, the excellent panel that we had before lunch, because in talking about the future of global jihad, we actually didn't really touch on Afghanistan, Pakistan area, uh, which, of course, as we all know, is the, uh, um, the, the source of, of a lot of the fun we've been having over the last couple of years. Um, so, uh, what we're doing in this project is we're examining uh, a large number of documents captured in Afghanistan that cover a wide range of ISK activities. Most significant ones being media, recruitment, governance, finance, operations, and organizational structure. Um, there are also some really interesting documents that covered some niche areas in things like innovation and technology, uh, child recruitment, um, and problems inside the organization. So examining this material, we hope, will help us answer our broader and central research question, which initially was, how do we explain ISK's organizational resilience in the face of what's been a pretty heavy counterterrorism uh, effort against it over the past three plus years. 
And at this point, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank someone who was instrumental in all of this, uh, Major Paul Lashenko, uh, who's a U.S. Army intelligence officer in the special operations community, and he's here this week. It's dark out there, so I can't see you, Paul. Uh, but uh, in addition to being a great soldier, uh, Paul is a great thinker on these issues, and he really helped move this project forward for us. Uh, in fact, hosted us out in Afghanistan for the data collection phase of this project. So, so thanks for that, Paul. Um, although I'm not sure if you thank somebody for bringing you to Afghanistan, but, um, but that's okay. Um, kidding, though, of course, that actually was an absolutely critical uh, part of this process and is really essential for any project like this is to get out there and, and see what's happening. Um, so anyways, uh, that's a pretty broad research question and is necessarily led to, necessarily led to several subtopics that we focused on. One of these, and the one that I'm going to talk about here today, uh, is understanding the relationship between ISK and the Islamic State's overall leadership in Iraq and Syria. Obviously, the degree to which Khorasan is receiving support from the state uh, plays a significant role in determining the key drivers of its own resilience. Um, as most of you in this room are well aware, there's been a fair amount of really useful and interesting work done on terrorist group uh, alliances and cooperation. Much, but not all of this work, however, uh, given when it came out, was based primarily on AQ and using AQ as its primary case studies. These studies of AQ affiliates has shown varying degrees of interest in adhering to the guidance provided by AQ Corps. Uh, but even that range went only from those who outright challenged AQ, uh, such as you know, AQI, ISI, ISIS, depending on what time period we're talking about, uh, to those who respectfully adhered to some of the guidelines, uh, but chose to ignore others when it didn't really suit their, their local needs. But what base, based on what we're seeing so far in ISK, however, is that this is a Wallaiat that appears to be doing everything it can uh, to tow the party line. And where it can't, it answers for its failures. Uh, more to follow on that in a few minutes. From its side, it's certainly clear that overall the Islamic State was intensely interested in exercising central control of its far-flung provinces. We found many documents that were generic guidance, uh, which provided detailed instructors, instructions on a wide variety of, of topics, um, including media. These are the documents I referred to earlier that my, my colleague Daniel wrote a report on. Um, HISPA, broader judicial processes, zakat, dawah, management of finances, um, a host of, of uh, instructional material. Um, they even provided hundreds of blank templates and forms uh, to ISK for the Wallayat to use as it began establishing its presence in Afghanistan. It's like the Islamic State starter pack, right? You too can be a Wali. Just sign up, receive this pack of materials, and you're well on your way to having your own Wallaiat, right? Um, now, of course, we've seen groups like uh, groups send out guidance like this in the past, but based on our initial assessment of this data, the level of detail and frequency of communication is truly noteworthy. Um, and we see significant back and forth between the two entities. It, IS isn't just sending out templates and documents and hoping for the best. They follow up with specific questions and requests for information to assess the progress made by the Wallaiat. There are some interesting exchanges that we see in the data, uh, with some showing a clear eagerness by ISK to please its masters. One letter was a response from a chief ISK deputy, uh, Abdul Hasib, to the caliph, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Uh, in it, he says, I'm quoting, thank you for asking me to send you a message. We are happy that our emirs watch over us, which funnily is exactly how I respond to all of my boss's emails, too, <laughs> except I call her colonel, not emir, which is probably better. Um, of, co of course, we soon see why he's being so nice, because after several paragraphs talking about how well they're doing, how great recruitment is going, uh, he then uh, branches into talking about their desperate need for more weapons, and that while he appreciates the money that was sent, it's only 20% of their needs, so keep it coming, please. Um, there are quite a number of letters from IS to ISK asking for information and data, uh, and not all responses are as diplomatic as Abdul Hasib's was. One letter was from an official named Yusuf in the ISK media office to his sheikhs back in an unspecified IS committee, presumably the media one, um, who had apparently chastised him for not sending in his required military reports. In it, he does what most of us are tempted to do when our boss challenges us, and that is he gives excuses. Um, he tells them that the brothers have been subjected to continuous bombing for the past three weeks, and that their media office has been completely destroyed. So way to go, Paul. You got Yusuf in trouble. Thanks, man. <laughs> Um, he says that their cameras were destroyed, as was their printer. He then points out that this was their only printer, and though most of the time they didn't have any ink for it. Um, so I think we can all sympathize with ink and toner struggles. Um, he then rattles off a list of accumulating problems. All their locations are known to the enemy. It's unfortunate. Uh, electricity is non-existent, leading them to rely on solar, which doesn't meet their needs. Uh, and, when it, and of course, he says that their internet network coverage is poor, and when it does work, it's incredibly slow. So slow that they can't even upload single images or files. Now, working for the U.S. Army, I can certainly sympathize with horrendous internet service. Um, I feel your pain, brothers. 
They're facing missiles and bombs. I'm facing an army of lawyers and contracting regulations that prevent me from simply ordering a new router on Amazon Prime. <laughs> so I'm not sure what's worse. Anyway, uh, despite the excuses we saw in this particular case, we did see regular responses from ISK to these requests for information. ISK's Wally sent regular updates of operations and activities back to the Caliph. The language of the ones we did see indicated that these were uh, should, probably should have been monthly reports um, and were framed that way, but so far we've only recovered a couple of them. Uh, one of the most significant data calls we saw was a February 20, 2017 letter from the Islamic State to the ISK Wali Abdul Hasib, who had been promoted uh, after the killing of Hafiz Said Khan, uh, that contained a list of seven requests. And those requests are, number one, a report containing information on all your soldiers to include name, date of birth, number of wives, number of children, weapons, what military course you've taken, what Sharia course they've taken. Number two, an inventory of all the Wilayat's weapons. Number three, explanation of any Sharia problems in the Wilayat. Four, explanation of any financial administrative problems plus solutions. Uh, five, clarification of your geographic presence. Number six, explanation of military plans and operations. And number seven, monthly budget. Um, we're still looking to see if they responded to all these requests, but the one that did jump out was that uh, Shortly thereafter, ISK did send back to the Islamic State a very professional and detailed spreadsheet providing all of that info I mentioned in number one, all that personal biographical information. Uh, and they provided this for 1,805 fighters across four regions. They even included a nice cover tab uh, that had summary statistics for all the mentioned categories. So for every staff officer in the room, you'd be incredibly impressed by what they pulled off. Uh, I've so far been describing some of the top level overarching communications, but we see this level of communication happening regularly across a range of more specific functional areas. I'll highlight a couple to dive a little deeper on. Um, first, finances. This was a regular topic of conversation, uh, and these usually consisted of ISK asking for more money and IS responding with requests for more information, presumably to instill confidence that it would be money well spent. Early in its existence, 2015, 2016 timeframe, ISK clearly relied on receiving funds directly from IS in Iraq and Syria. They regularly discussed the mechanics of moving funds from the Levant to Afghanistan and all the challenges they encountered along the way. Uh, the Wali is quite blunt with the Caliph on a number of occasions when things are not going well, pointing out in one letter, right now we are confronting a financial crisis worth mourning. Um, and he points out that he's having trouble paying stipends and salaries. He also surely recognizes that he's actually in competition with the other Wilayat uh, around the world for funds, saying, the status of Khorasan differs from the rest of the Wilayat in that there's so many problems here. He's highlighting the highly competitive militant landscape in, uh, in Afghanistan and suggesting that he needs funds more than the other Wilayats uh, and his counterparts spread elsewhere around the world. Uh, by August, however, in one of his monthly updates, he said they'd actually have finally been able to start paying more salaries, not clear if these two are tied, to get, collect, uh, excuse me, tied together, but interesting nonetheless. So at the management level, uh, senior management level, we also see regular communications between representatives discussing specifically how to move these funds back and forth. Um, over time, they seem to be in, uh, encountering more difficulties. And what we see into 2017 and 2018 is less communication about money coming directly from the core um, and more reliance on fundraising uh, locally uh, in Afghanistan. The second category to discuss is organization and governance. As mentioned above, there's a very large amount of material captured that demonstrates how far IS went to provide ISK with all the systems, processes, and tools needed to follow the caliphate's path. This includes org charts for uh, uh, Diwan of Dawa and Moss, Diwan of Zakat and Al-Hispa, Islamic police, uh, work processes for judicial systems, um, templates for how to document judicial issues and police activity. Uh, also recovered was a series of letters from the Emir of Diwan al hispa at the IS level to all the regional Wali at the Walayat around the world with specific guidance on a range of topics including beard shaving, long hair for youth, imported meat products, stopping male doctors from treating women, cheating in trades, a variety of specific issues. Um, again, ISK didn't just quietly receive these missives. They sometimes went back to IS asking for guidance on specific issues. In one case, uh, there was a couple brothers who were sowing discord in the ranks, and they sent a letter back to, to CORE asking, hey, you know, what's, what's some advice you can give us on how to handle this situation? All right, the final area I want to cover is media. On this topic, I encourage you to go check out our website, check out that report I mentioned earlier. Um, that report focused specifically on IS uh, and its communications with all of its Wilayat. It found that IS's Diwan of Central Media used numerous policies and programs to centralize control over the propaganda production process. These communications range from high-level policy documents uh, explaining the Diwan's approach to media operations to all the way down to very specific guidance regarding the most effective camera angles to use in certain shots, lists of questions, sample, like sample questions you can use if you're going out and interviewing a member of the public. Um, this is all covered in that report. 
What isn't covered, uh, however, is uh, that we also found numerous documents specific to ISK's relationship with, uh, with the Islamic State um, in, uh, in the media domain. IS communicated very specific requests to ISK to include a message from the editors of the IS weekly newsletter, al Napa, uh, with questions for the ISK Wali to answer for an article, and guidance that each answer should be 200 words and include specific information instead of just general talking, which is probably what Stevie and Jonathan want to tell all of us speakers here at this conference this week. Um, and ISK regularly communicated back with explanations of challenges it was having in the production of media. Finally, uh, we see evidence that when IS sends out documents outlining certain policies, they're actually put into practice, or at least they attempt to put them into practice. For example, one of their media guidance documents talks about the review process for materials, specifically that ISK, or any will for that matter, is not allowed to issue official media releases on its own, but rather has to run every product back through the ISD one of central media. One might have thought that to be impractical, and maybe not followed all the time, just too hard, communications, all that. Um, but sure enough, we find in their files multiple examples of media products that had been edited and commented on by IS, and ultimately indications of final approval for release. Uh, so yes, IS has mastered track changes in Word. It's all over now. Um, while we've seen that IS exerted its influence across a variety of areas, it's in media that it exercises the most control. This makes sense for two reasons. One, the overall importance it places on media, but we all know this, it's oft discussed. Um, but two, it has a greater ability to verify compliance in the media space. Ultimately, for the other issues I talked about, governance, finance, uh, they mostly have to trust that what ISK tells them they're doing is actually happening. Uh, it's difficult, if not impossible, to validate in many cases. But media production is different, as they, and of course the rest of the world, uh, sees the end result, and they're prepared to take action if their guidance is not followed. So to sum up, um, the existing literature on cooperation between terrorist entities uh, looks at cooperation across three areas, ideological, logistical, and operational. For IS and ISK, while ideological cooperation is probably the most important um, and is present in the materials, in terms of sheer numbers, the bulk of communications were really uh, in, the, uh, in terms of logistical cooperation. Op operational cooperation was more limited by comparison. IS certainly wanted uh, to be kept up to date on ISK's uh, operational activity, but does not appear to have been very directive in terms of dictating ISK operations on the front end. This is most likely due to practical realities and not wanting to limit the Wilayat's operational tempo, tempo or flexibility. Probably the best work out there on the mechanics of how terrorist groups uh, manage their operations and their relationships is Jake Shapiro's book, The Terrorist Dilemma. It's a fantastic book. Uh, for those who haven't read it, the dilemma is this. He says, leaders need to control how violence is executed and how finances are managed, but the tools to do so create operational vulnerabilities and therefore increase the likelihood of operatives being caught and a group compromised. So if we're to apply that to, to this particular case, IS clearly feels it's worth the risk to try to exert this level of control. And while I'm not going to stand here today and tie together specific terrorist and counter-terrorist uh, actions, I think we can assume that their efforts to communicate and do these things probably played a role in the key losses ISK has experienced uh, over the last couple of years, three Wally's killed in two years. Um, but despite these losses, they have persisted, and that's the real challenge. It'll be interesting to try to assess how certain environmental factors and changes, such as advances in encrypted communications, uh, have reduced the risk Shapiro highlights as limiting factors to exerting control. IS and ISK were certainly in regular communication for a long time before some of those individuals involved were removed from the battlefield. Uh, we've talked a lot at this conference about the use of technology, um, and I definitely feel this is a growth area for our field. So uh, in sum, this project is a work in progress, and there's certainly gaps that we're working to fill, uh, but hopefully this was enough to drive home the value that, that research, the research community can add by conducting strategic analysis of this type of material. Um, access to this material is a unique advantage that we have and can be married with our other sources of data to present a more complete picture of our adversaries and their trajectory. So thanks for your time. Um, I look forward to seeing you out there. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. And also, thanks for your sense of humor, uh, which I actually appreciated. I laughed at a couple of your jokes. And it just shows you that we can uh, sometimes laugh our way through counterterrorism also. But you made a great presentation, and I would, would want to thank you very much. You kept up the West Point tradition at this conference. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Joseph Apondo. He's the Deputy Director for National Counterterrorism Center SNCTC in Kenya, Mr. Onyago 
Opondo is the deputy director of the National Counterterrorism Center in Kenya. He's the holder of a Bachelor of Commerce degree from the University of South Africa, a master's in business administration from Cambridge University in the UK in strategic planning and knowledge management. He's a graduate of the Sherman Kent University of Analysis, alumni of East and Southern Management Institute. He has held various security-related positions in the government of Kenya at senior levels, a part-time panelist and moderator with the Africa Center for Strategic Studies uh, campuses in Dakar, Senegal. He's also been a senior lecturer at, at Government of Kenya School of Management. Uh, Mr. Onyango Opono has over 30 years in public service and is a holder of the Order of Grand Warrior of Kenya OGW National Award. And uh, the floor is yours. And uh, I repeat what I just said to the West Point representative. We're proud of the Kenyan students who have come to IDC Herzliya and have completed master's degrees in counterterrorism from your great country of Kenya. The floor is yours. Let me take this opportunity to thank uh, the Institute for inviting Kenya to this uh, uh, meeting. Uh, this is my second uh, year. I was here last year. I was impressed. That's why I'm back again. I'll be a bit brief. Uh, distinguished participants, I want to thank the ICT for the invitation to be part of these deliberations. Furthermore, I want to say how glad I am to be in Israel, whose experience with terrorism, unfortunately, knows few equals. It's a chance for me to listen and learn. We, have, we both share a common threat against our security posed by deranged people who don't believe in any religion. For instance, recent arrests in our country show the Islamic State's growing presence in East Africa where they are recruiting young Kenyans for jihad abroad and raising fears that some of them will return to threaten the country. We in Kenya have been assaulted by hateful, unthinking cowards whose depravity motivates them to seek gratification in killing and maiming innocent, harmless people. Their moral deformity is monstrous and appealing. Their commitment to evil has robbed their hearts of the merest suggestion of human consideration. That does not mean they are impregnable. Terrorism can and must be fought mercilessly and defeated where it occurs. Working together, therefore, will help us defeat the scourge of this terror even faster. In this regard, I want to acknowledge with gratitude the important cooperation we have with the State of Israel and with several more important allies who are represented here. In every major attack we have suffered, our friends have rallied to our side. We are grateful for this solidarity. As a result of our close ties with Israel, Kenyan security troops have benefited from increased training, equipment, and intelligence sharing, which has boosted their combat capability in the war against terrorism. Our partnership in fighting terrorism has led to great benefits, particularly in terms of strategic intelligence and analytical capabilities. Allow me now to make a few more comments on the phenomena of global migration integration and terrorism, the main topic, topics which will preoccupy me during this conference. The terrorist threat in Europe is at a peak and continues to grow. Europe is therefore facing a genuinely transnational threat with strong links to armed conflicts raging across the Muslim world. IS continues to be the most prominent threat and although military efforts against ISIS in Syria and Iraq have reduced the combat capability of the group, as well as its territorial control, IS has consequently stalked 
started giving more priority to hitting Western targets in our country through planned more complex attacks such as the ones in Paris and Brussels. While a majority of European militants are disenfranchised migrants, a smaller number of entrepreneurs, resourceful and ideologically motivated terrorist cell builders play a crucial role in formation of terrorist cells. The entrepreneurs operate on behalf of armed groups in conflict zones, making the threat more ideological, strategic, and organized than many assume. Entrepreneurs tend to be veterans of jihadi activism within Europe and through their foreign fighting, and there has been a veteran effect, quote unquote, in European Judaism, which applies to IS threats. A generalized identity crisis among young second generation descendants of immigrant Muslims, as elsewhere, appears then to lie behind the most recent unprecedented jihadist mobilization. Migrant descendants born of socialized, born and se or socialized in a European country are often caught in an odd balance between cultures <coughs> and especially prone to identity crisis connected with the diaspora situation. Too many of them have developed little, if any, affection for the EU nation in which they were born or raised, even though they show scant attachment to the nation from which their parents or grandparents originated. Jihadist propaganda offers an extreme violent solution to their people's identity conflicts, rather than with different concept of nation, the nation of Islam as promised by Islamic State and also Al-Qaeda. This phenomenon is also common in our part of the world. We are a country that has been under constant attack by terrorist groups, by Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab, and with ISIS now joining them. Into this mix, into this mix we struggle to manage the return of hundreds of Kenyans returning from Somalia, where they make up a significant number of Al-Shabaab's foreign fighters. In the future, we will likely also have to deal with returning IS extremists as well as self-radicalized lone wolf attackers inspired by extremist ideology and online propaganda. It is therefore not far-fetched to suppose that we in Kenya risk finding ourselves fairly soon in the position that Europe finds itself in. With regard to returning fighters, the Islamic threat is growing in Europe because of the return of many of the European Europeans who have gone off to Syria and Iraq to fight for Islamic State. Many of these radicalized fighters are returning to Europe with the combat skills and real military experience that translate into further acts of terror. Foreign fighters generally gain training and combat experience that can lead to more sophisticated and deadly attacks. We know that the presence of foreign jihadi veterans both dramatically increases the terrorist plot's chance of success and their attacks' lethality. The challenge posed by the Sunnis is threefold. Recidivism rates are uncertain. Law enforcement cannot manage the numbers of prospective returnees alone, and returnees from non-Western countries pose a threat to their home countries. A global architecture should be put in place to mitigate the threats from foreign fighter returnees. These are serious concerns to Kenya and the Horn of Africa because our youth through developments in technology and telephony are readily accessing these tactics and skills. In Kenya, we have an estimated 3 million holders of smartphones. Kenyans follow and everybody voluntarily to be as a fan of any of the European football teams. I also belong to one we can discuss later. NCTC appreciates being part of the summit. Neither the attacker nor the defenders can afford to rest. In the long run, they are forever spanning one another on. Attackers develop new ways to defeat counter countermeasures, which in turn leads defenders to develop better countermeasures. In turn, attackers develop better methods of attacks and so forth. While these results 
at the right moment and the right mix like this conference can be extremely effective. It is also the wish of the NCTC Kenya that you will find some time and space during this conference and give some thoughts and way forward on the nexus between cultism and radicalization with particular emphasis on how either should be an easier path to radicalization or recruitment into violent extremism. Finally, in the fight against terror, we join all of you here today to say that we shall not relent. We shall sustain to work the work of keeping the world safe to protect ourselves and our property. Terrorism aims to destroy the precious freedoms we all have fought so far so hard to win. We not know peace so long as this threat of terror exists in the world. Today, I stand here before you to reaffirm our resolve as a country to stand with the international community. We are well aware that the peace and security have a price. Our job is to minimize the risk to our people. And now ends and ways. The National Counterterrorism Center, apart from other initiatives, has put in place a multi-agency unit to deal with disengagement, rehabilitation, and reintegration of the returnees, both in and out of the correctional and aftercare units. In doing this, we have also pulled in other non-state actors, especially community-based organizations and other non-government operatives. Thank you very much. May God bless Israel, bless the whole world. Thank you. And Joseph, may God bless uh, Kenya. And, um, and thank you for uh, sharing with us the courageous efforts that you're making in Kenya to fight terrorism. And we're really happy for the close relations between the State of Israel and Kenya. We share many of the same values. Um, and uh, may we all succeed together, Kenya and Israel and everyone else at this conference in basically achieving uh, the goals which uh, you discussed here, which you're working with at your center in Nairobi. And uh, once more, it's great to have Kenya as an integral part of this conference. And now, you wanna clap? Clap, clap. I want, I want you to clap for Kenya. They've suffered from tremendous terrorism and, um, and Israel has indirectly been involved there um, as well with an Israeli aircraft which uh, was attacked, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We won't go into it. Um, and uh, now I'm the only guy between you and the break. So you guys have been such a uh, patient and tolerant audience after lunch that you deserve a 40-minute break. And we will be back here at four o'clock in the afternoon. So enjoy the coffee and stretch a little bit. We'll see you at four o'clock. <laughs>